there wasn't like a weekly place to worship in in a Jewish way. So I um, I attended a, a regular um, congregation, a regular church congregation, as I was as I was growing up, and um, and they had a song that was actually a really horrible <laughs> song for children, but God can use anything. But this song kind of terrified me, and it went like this. One door and only one, and yet the sides are two. I'm on on the inside. On which side are you? (laughs) What's up, friends? I was having a conversation with someone, and they asked if I was going to make my children believe in Jesus like I do. And I found this question interesting. And when I thought about it for a second, I realized that trying to make someone believe in something is the antithesis of faith. Salvation is based on our faith in the finished work of the Messiah, Yeshua, and cannot be something that we force or impose on people. In one of the most famous Bible verses, John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever prays and does good deeds or whoever follows in their parents' footsteps will have everlasting life. No, but whoever believes... So my response was, my faith in Jesus is not their faith, and my children will have to have their own relationship with God apart from my will and desire. Now, this doesn't absolve me from my role as a believing parent to speak about God and his way of salvation through Yeshua in my home, which does, of course, influence them, but they must come to that conclusion and make their decision on their own. Our special guest today, Ruth Rosen, is a writer, author, and has a degree in biblical studies from Biola College. She was raised by parents that believed in Jesus. Her father, Moshe Rosen, is actually the founder of Jews for Jesus Ministry. She came to faith at an early age, but had her struggles. And she's here today to share with us her amazing journey of faith in Jesus, Yeshua, as a Jewish woman. Hey, Ruth, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for um, letting me be your guest today. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Me too. So, um, you know, you can find testimonies of of Jewish believers in Jesus all over the Internet now, and the numbers are, are rising you know, all over the world, and more and more Jews are actually deciding to look into the possibility of Jesus as Messiah and Savior instead of having that decision made for them by other people. Your testimony is unique in that you grew up in a home of believers, uh, yet you had struggles regarding your own faith in Yeshua. So Ruth, can you tell us your story and perhaps get into how you see Yeshua differently now uh, than how you did when you were a child? Sure, sure. Um, well, having grown up in a messianic home um, at the time that I did is is actually very different than it is today. We didn't have like a lot of messianic synagogues. Um, we knew that we were Jewish. We celebrated Passover. You know, we had matzah with peanut butter and jelly and 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 things like that. But um, but there wasn't like a weekly place to worship in in a Jewish way. So I. Um, I attended a, a regular um, congregation, a regular church congregation, as I was as I was growing up, and um, and they had a song that was actually a really horrible <laughs> song for children, but God could use anything. But this song kind of terrified me, and it went like this: one door and only one, and yet the sides are two. I'm on on the inside. On which side are you? <laughs> <laughs> right, which was which was you know, uh, if I were teaching children, that's not what I would do. But like I said, God could use anything, and, yeah. I, and I just knew that I was not on the inside. Mm. I just knew it. I, um, from the time I was very young, I was really aware of, um, for lack of a better word, my sin. Mm. Um, and um, oh. you might think, well, what can a little kid, you know, do? But, you know, when I was five years old, you know, I'd be with my mom in the grocery store and we'd go down the aisle and there'd be marshmallows. And I loved marshmallows, but we could only have them as a special treat. And so and so I say, Mommy, can we get the marshmallows? And she would say no. She always said no. Mm. And I would let her kind of go on down the aisle and I would kind of hang out there until she couldn't see me. And then I would take and I would squeeze and pinch those bags of marshmallows and try and make a little hole in as many bags as I could. Mm. And and in my mind, I was imagining 
you know, some other little girl saying, mommy, can we have the marshmallows? And she'd say, sure, sweetie. And then she'd say, oh, no, we can't. The bag is ripped. Mm. I just knew that that was so horrible of me and it was so ugly of me. And I knew that because of things like that in my life that now might seem silly and laughable, but actually come from a very serious, you know, problem in in the human heart. Mm. And I knew that it was bad. So I was I was scared because I was on the outside and mm. I didn't exactly know what that meant, but I knew that it but I knew that it wasn't good. <laughs> and uh so on the fourth of July, um we were um I think we were in Oregon and uh, my dad was speaking at like a family camp and my mom had stayed back with me and I was just kind of staring out the window and she saw that I was unhappy and she said, What's wrong? And I said, well, I don't want to go to hell. Mm. And she said, well, who told you that you're going to hell? And I said, well, nobody, but I know that God doesn't allow sin in hell and in heaven. And, you know, hell is the other place and I have sin, you know. And I'm sure that I had heard the gospel before, but it didn't necessarily, you know, what happened out there and what Jesus did for the world, it didn't necessarily mean that he did it for me. So my mom kind of, you know, very sweetly said, you know, well, we can take care of that right now. Do you want to do that? And and so she led me in an understanding that, you know, Jesus dying for the sin of the world wasn't just something out there, but it, that it was for me personally. And so um, we prayed and she said, do you feel any different? And I said, no, can we do it again? And <laughs> I've not always been able to feel, you know, what what I thought I should feel. And so after like three times, I decided I would just trust her that she knew what she was talking about. But actually, I, I received Jesus more out of fear than anything else because I knew that something was wrong and you know, and I didn't want to be in that bad place. Mm. Um, as as I grew older, I was I I was very concerned for my friends. I I wanted them also to you know to be safe. You know, I yeah. I wanted things for them, and um, you know, and they 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 would say, "No, I'm Jewish." When I tell the gospel, I say, "Well, I am too," and that didn't always go over very well. But right. you know, but I did my best. But again, it was it was really still out of fear. Then when I got to be um, um, close to 15 years old, I had a different kind of fear. And that was, I'm never going to know anything except being this this good kid who always does what she's supposed to and never going to experience anything in life that God wouldn't want me to experience. And I just, you know, I'm just tired of it. I'm just really tired of it. And, um, and I don't want to have to worry about what... God says and what he wants. I just I just want to live my own life for a while. But but just until I graduate high school. <laughs> you know. And then, you know, I'll experience, you know, what I'm going to but I won't do anything too life altering. I won't ruin my life, you know. I won't get pregnant or, you know, whatever. I won't yep. get addicted to drugs. But I just won't have to worry about what God thinks all the time. And so, I I embarked on that journey kind of out of a fear of missing out, I guess. FOMO is like a big deal and I guess I had a little bit of that. And um, so that didn't really work out so well. <clears throat> uh, most of my rebellion was in my head, in my thoughts, just, you know, the thing with the marshmallows and that kind of sin. It was like, it, it was all in my head and in my inner landscape, which has always been very robust. Yeah. But, um, but I was liking myself less and less. I was becoming, you know, more depressed, more moody. And my friends would ask me, you know, well, what's what's wrong? And I would say, well, I had this great relationship with God and I kind of walked away and I'm sure someday I'll turn back. But for now, it's just really crappy, mm. <laughs> except I used a different word. Well, yeah, you're so you're 15 when you're saying this. Yeah, yeah. because even even though you're rebelling, it's still kind of a mature thing to say, you know. Anyway, um, I, I had a, I had a boyfriend who was really what we now would call toxic for me, and um, and I was actually afraid of him too. <laughs> so you can see the big role that fear played in my life, at least up to a point. 
<clears throat> it was a relationship that was not um, taking me anywhere good, and um, but I was too emotionally enmeshed to really to be able to break it off. And so my first prayer in a very long time was, God, you know, I know I've been stupid and I, you know, I haven't cared what you think, but if you still love me, please get me out of this relationship with this guy. And, and like within a week it happened hmm. and it, it was something that was totally, you know, beyond my control. I mean, he didn't even really mean to break up with me and he tried to get back together after that, but I was like, no, God did this. Wow. Um, so, um, but I, I didn't immediately, um, kind of get back on track. I was, you know, my, my friends and I, you know, I, I, I fit in well with them, even though later I found out that they still thought I was <laughs> pretty much, you know, the good kid, you know, like I can, I had considered at one point dropping acid and years later when I told the friend that I was going to ask for, she said, I never would have given that to you. <laughs> so you know, so God was still like looking out for me, you know, even when I thought I was being rebellious. But, but, um, so my sister invited me out of the blue to a Juice for Jesus Bible study. And I, I don't know why, because I had not been going for like a really long time. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I said, no. And she said, oh, come on. And I said, well, why would I want to go? And she said, well, I already got a ride for you, which was like a really stupid reason. But for some, reason i said okay so i went in um early days of juice for jesus before we were even incorporated and sitting on the floor in corner madeira and i looked around and i thought i told god if he loved me to get me out of the relationship and he did i'm looking around this room and even though i've been so selfish and stupid these people love me i have no idea what was taught from the bible that night mm. but just the sense that I was loved. And so my motivation went from fear to knowing that I was loved. And that just and that just broke my heart. It, you know, it was like, I don't know how you still love me. You know, I'm still this mean, you know, marshmallow girl. <laughs> I mean, I was very kind on the outside. I think everybody would have said that I was kind and, you know. Yeah. But I knew what I was inside. And, yeah. And the fact that I was loved just, so I went home that night and I, I remember wrestling with, with God before going to sleep and saying, you know, God, I know that I need to, I, I know that I need to come back and renew my relationship with you and, but I don't want to, and it's so uncomfortable and I'm, you know, what will my friends think? And there were really only two friends that I was worried about. And so I said, um, God, okay here's the deal. I'll rededicate my life to you if you just, you know, make it easy for me to tell my friends. Hmm. And I'm not somebody who says God told me this or God spoke to me that, but that night I, I remember very clearly a thought came to me that was not my thought. <laughs> and it was like, what I did for you wasn't easy. And I'm like, hmm. okay, fair enough. Wow. So, Okay, so I get it. You're not going to make it easy for me, but so, but just help me to follow through and do it. And I got the feeling like, yeah, I'll do that. That's I great. That. That's great. It's, it's, it's funny because we all we, we often pray our, try to pray our way out of issues and try our, try to pray our way out of problems, and yet it's the problem that actually we need to face and and to find our strength in in God and what He's done to get us through the problem instead of have Him take away the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely so true um so things things went along with my my faith i think you know it was in a sense it was stronger but it still it still wasn't exactly life-changing because i grew up you know i had a, a good upbringing yeah wasn't a whole lot outwardly you know that one might have thought needed to change i got good grades decent people skills and so forth whatever gifts god gave me you know right but by the time i was in my 40s i i just felt like i was stuck like you know it was the same thing 
outwardly everything was fine, but inwardly I knew that I didn't really want God running my life. I mean, I was already working in ministry. I'm already serving him. I'm already like doing what I should be doing. Yeah. But but then I realized that I hadn't completely surrendered my life to God. Why? Well, we come back to the fear. And fear is basically I might get something that I don't want or I might not get something that I do want. And that's why it's hard to surrender to God. I, I know I know that a lot of people can relate to your story, which is which is why I want I'm I'm happy that people are hearing it because you know, oh, someone had this this um experience where they experienced Jesus, they gave their life to Jesus and and their life was just, you know, it was better and everything. They didn't have their struggles, but I'm I'm at home struggling and I don't I don't really know if I believe. I I, I thought I did, but I'm not sure. And this story is really important because I would I would have to say that more people than not would relate to what you're saying. So I I really felt kind of stuck, and then uh, I had an interesting experience um, where I I had an assignment at work, and by now I was I was writing and editing full time um, in ministry um, with Juice for Jesus, mm-hmm. and I was given an assignment that like wasn't one of my favorite assignments, um, but it needed to be done, and I was the right person to do it, and it yeah. took a long. And it was bothersome on a few levels. And when I finished it, um, our executive director, um, David Brickner, asked me, you know, he said, you know, that that was a good job. I would like to give you a perk. What would you like? And um, and he listed a few things, um, you know, travel to Europe, take photos, do this, do that, you know, bonus or whatever. And I thought about it and and. And really, the only the only thing that came to mind um, was just, well, just you know, let me have your ear if there's something I feel that I need to say, you know. And um, and I think he was pleased with that. Um, but that night, as, again, as I was going to sleep, um, in that that part of my mind where a thought occurred that did not seem to be something that I would think. And I, I do believe it was from God. Was what if I asked you, what do you want? Mm. And I, I, I felt it was like, God, why would you, you know, are, are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an audible voice or anything like that, but it certainly wasn't, you know. And I, and I thought about it, not for very long, and I said, I would ask you to change me, because I'm. I'm stuck. Mm. Um, and by stuck, it was just, you know, I had given him, I was serving him supposedly full time, but in my heart, I didn't really trust him. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't really, I wasn't really all there in terms of surrendering my heart to him. And, and I felt that God was responding to me saying, I like that. I will do that, but don't expect that right away. Mm-hmm. And it was actually years later. Um, it was in 2016, and um, my dad had passed away in 2010. His yard site is tomorrow, by the way, as we're 13 years. Um, my dad had passed away. My beloved dog was sick. <laughs> um, her days were kind of numbered. My mother had been um, diagnosed with congested heart failure. Mm. She ended up living another couple of years with that diagnosis. But and and I was sitting in my den, and I thought, God, you are the only one who loves me who I love who isn't going to die um I really I need to have a closer relationship with you and I started thinking about it and why you know why don't I you know why why after decades of you know having given my life to Jesus you know why why am I here in this place now realizing that 
I have so little to show for it. I started to do an inventory and I thought, what am I, what am I seeing in my life that talk that that demonstrates a transformation, you know, that we're promised. You know, where's the fruit? You know, where's the love, the joy, the peace, yeah. the patience, the you know, the kindness, the faithfulness, the long suffering, gentleness, and and all of that. And a lot of it was there on the surface, but it wasn't really deep inside. If something bad happened, you know, those fruits weren't necessarily what was going to come out. Mm-hmm. And when I started to think, what am I afraid of? I realized that I was most afraid of losing the blessings that God had given me, you know, losing my parents, losing my dog, losing this or losing that. And I suddenly was hit hard with something I probably knew all along, but I had never really looked into (laughs) the ugly face of my ingratitude where I loved God, for all the blessings that he'd given me, I really appreciated all the good things, but I was more concerned with hanging on to what God had given me than I was concerned with hanging on to God himself. Mm. Wow. Um, wow. And uh, and there was nothing I could do about it. And I said, God, I I can't. This is this is how it's always been. I've always, I've always cherished your gifts more than I've cherished you. Mm. I'm not going to change. I can't change. If you want me to change, you have to change me. I love that. It's such a powerful prayer. And I just want to encourage people that are watching. It's, it's, it's a, it's a prayer that I think all of us should pray, you know, father, change me into the person that you want me to be. Um, and I think that's a, it's a great sign that we're aware of our own sin. Because if we're not praying that prayer, we think we're 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 doing all right and we're you know we're on the right track where we got everything together and and as soon as we hold on to that thought that we have it all together, that's when we start to when things start to fall apart with regards to our faith. So I just want to encourage anybody that's out there that's listening right now, um, make that a part of your daily prayer. You know, God continue to change me to the person you want me to be. And. And it, it's so true. And I think it was at that point that um, that my understanding of sin finally came into focus. Mm-hmm. You know, from the squeezing the marshmallow bags to the, you know, dating somebody I wasn't supposed to be dating, and all of the lists, the checklists of things we should do or things we shouldn't do, or things that are nice or things that are not nice, or just like a long list of, you know you know, what's ethical and what's moral, that list of of what, you know, what we do and how we relate to other people. And what I realized was, yes, those things matter. But the heart of sin is not is is not doing or not doing the right checklist. It's it's wanting God to be God in my life. Mm-hmm. And and if I want God to be any less than God, if I just want God to be the dispenser of blessings, right. you know, um, which of course I'm, He's happy to bless, you know. It, it, but if all I want is is Him to be giving to me, and I'm and uh, and I don't trust Him enough to say, okay, whatever you want, right? You know, not my will, but Your will. I can't say not my will, but your will. It's because in my eyes, he's still not God. Mm. And that's the biggest, and that's the heart of sin. And that's, you know, that's that was what was the problem, you know, in the garden. Um, people were tempted to think, well, you don't need God to know the difference between right and wrong. You know, what if, you know, what if you could just know that on your own? And then, you know, you would be the master of your own fate and, and all of that. Yeah. And, and, because there are people who don't know Jesus who do just as well, you know, or even better at relating to other human beings. But none of us, apart from God's grace, are able to want God to be God, to to embrace the fact that he knows more, that he has more power, that he actually has a right to get in our business. I guess that's pretty much my story. And in... Like you said, every day, you know, that prayer changed me, helped me to welcome, you know, and God is really sweet about yeah. pointing out where where we should change when we welcome it. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, I think that, that praying the prayer, God changed me to the person that you want me to be shows us that we're aware of our sin, but, but also, um, the fact that you're praying that, um, that, that prayer in and of itself wouldn't come from an unrepentant heart, a person that doesn't have the spirit of God living in him. Um, so that's an, it's, it's another, what you what you could say is a fruit that it doesn't necessarily express itself outwardly, but inwardly, we know he's there. We know he's real. And even though if you're watching this, you might not feel you're really that connected to him. There's a really big difference between living in sin and loving it and living for God and struggling with it. There's, there, it's, there's a huge difference. And I think maybe some people, a takeaway could be, hey, I'm struggling with God do I actually believe? And the fact that you're struggling with God is a wonderful, is struggling with faith in God is a wonderful because there's a great Bible verse, you know, God help me in my unbelief. And I think if we cling to that and we realize that unbelief goes back to the, 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 the garden um, and it's continued throughout human history. And so I think that the points that you've made were, were priceless. And I thank you for sharing your testimony, Ruth. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. To find out more about Ruth and her work, click on the link below in the description and stay tuned for our next episode where Ruth will be dealing with common arguments against the God of the Bible and his sovereignty. To find out more about Jews for Jesus, you can visit us and even chat with us anonymously at our website, jewsforjesus.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And may you all find peace and hope in our Messiah, Yeshua.